A Red Red Rose by Robert Burns. Do you know what happens in Scotland on the 25th of January every year? It is Burns Night and the people of Scotland prepare a traditional meal of haggis, turnips and potatoes with lots of scotch whiskey of course. They bring out their bagpipes and sing the songs and recite the poems of Robert Burns and toast to the immortal memory of Scotland's national bard. Robert Burns was born in the latter half of the 18th century. And if you look at the dates, you will see that he died at the young age of 37. Yet, he continues to live on in the hearts of the Scottish people. In this video lesson, we'll first discuss a few socio-political changes that happened in Scotland in the 18th century and the subsequent rise of Burns to poetic fame. In the second section, we look at Burns' role as a songwriter and review the publication history of the Red Red Rose. In the last section of the video, we'll discuss the poem in some detail. Robert Burns in 18th century Scotland The year 1707 was a watershed year in the history of Scotland. This year saw the union of the Scottish and English parliaments to form the Parliament of Great Britain. As a result of the union, Edinburgh lost its status as the parliamentary capital of Scotland. And politicians, parliamentarians and aristocrats migrated to England for better prospects. The social life in Edinburgh and Glasgow at the time was dominated by professionals such as lawyers, professors from the universities in these cities, as well as scientists and physicians. This intellectual elite included the likes of the economist Adam Smith and the philosopher David Hume, and a period of intellectual vigour and philosophical inquiry followed, which is often called the Scottish Enlightenment. Many of these Scottish intellectuals also considered themselves British, and the societies they formed at this time reflect a trend towards anglicisation. For example, there was a society for promoting the reading and speaking of the English tongue. They went to great lengths to avoid Scotticisms in their writing and aspired for improvement in themselves and the society of the time. The economic growth of these towns and the ideology of improvement that accompanied the Enlightenment trickled down to the lowlands of Scotland as well. In these lowlands, it manifested in the conscious effort made by the gentry, the nobility and later the landed classes to improve agriculture. The English plough was introduced and so were new crops such as potatoes and turnips and lands were enclosed. In the agricultural revolution and the commercialization of farmlands that soon followed, the worst affected people were the tenant farmers and the quarters. Unable to afford the increasing rents of these commercialized farmlands, Hundreds of tenant farmers and quarters migrated to places within the Scottish lowlands and even abroad in search of better opportunities. Though the Union of 1707 brought about far-reaching changes in the life of people in these lowlands, it is not believed to have lasting influences on the language of the people here. In these parts of the country, the people read and spoke in the Scots language and consumed vernacular literature in the form of chapbooks, ballads and broadsides. It was in a tenant farm in these lowlands of Scotland that Robert Burns was born. One should caution against romanticizing Burns as the heaven-taught plowman, but also acknowledge that the family led a life of constant struggle and hardship. Burns was the son of a tenant farmer in Ayrshire and the family occupied the middle rung of the social hierarchy above the peasants but below the landed classes. Unable to afford the agricultural wages of the time, the entire family contributed to working in the farm and Burns described himself as a dexterous plowman for his teenage years. After work, Burns was mostly educated by his father at home and was also sent sporadically to parish schools where he learned French, Latin as well as English literature. Burns' mother is believed to have been a major influence in his love for Scottish vernacular literature in the form of ballads and songs. A study of Burns's youth reveals that he was an ambitious young man struggling to make a living on the one hand. On the other hand, he was also a licentious and unfaithful man. 
Burns's early attempts at versification, which were recorded in a commonplace book, were inspired both by his intimate understanding of Scottish peasant life and his romantic relationships. In Burns's own words, he wrote himself out as he was placed by fortune among a class of men to whom his ideas would have been nonsense. He cherished the fond hope that some day his thoughts would fall into the hands of someone capable of appreciating their value. The first collection of Burns's poems, titled Poems Chiefly in the Scottish Dialect, was published in the year 1786 by a printer at Kilmarnock. The Kilmarnock edition included some of Burns's best works, such as The Quarters, Saturday Night, and To a Mouse. This edition saw his sudden and almost unexpected rise to fame, and the poet was soon invited to Edinburgh for the making of a second edition. At Edinburgh, Burns was welcomed into the literary circle and hailed as the heaven-taught plowman. Although highly inaccurate, this romanticized image of an unlettered pastoral persona helped to further his poetic fame. At this point, we should also keep in mind that it was Burns' interest in the Scottish vernacular and popular song and his sympathetic treatment of rural life that in a way marks the transition from the neoclassical period to the romantic period in literature. What is of immediate significance to us as readers of The Red Red Rose is that it was in Edinburgh that Burns met James Johnson and began a lifelong collaboration in collecting Scottish lyrics and music for posterity. That brings us to the next section of the lesson, Robert Burns, the songwriter and the Red Red Rose. Burns contributed about 200 songs to Johnson's collection called the, the Scots Musical Museum, which was published in six volumes between the years 1787 and 1803. Burns also worked with George Thompson, a music collector and publisher, in a similar project titled A Select Collection of Original Scottish Airs for the Voice. Thompson, a sophisticated editor, had sought Burns's help to improve the lyrics or the music of certain Scottish melodies which he thought were inappropriate for decent company. In fact, Burns had originally intended the Red Red Rose for Thompson's collection, but we understand that he and Thompson had varying opinions on the song's merit. In a letter to the poet Cunningham, Burns wrote about this disagreement. What to me appears the simple and the wild, to him, and I suspect to you likewise, will be looked on as the ludicrous and the absurd. Burns' A Red Red Rose was first published in the year 1794 in a selection of Scott songs harmonized, improved with simple and adapted graces by Pietro Urbani, an Italian musician who was based in Edinburgh at the time. In the preface to the song, Urbani mentions that the words of the Red Red Rose were given to him by a celebrated Scots poet, Burns had chosen to be anonymous for this collection, who was so struck with the lyrics when it was sung by a country girl that he noted those down. But Burns was not so pleased with the air or the music that he begged the author to set them to music in the style of a Scots tune. Instead, Urbani came up with a music of his own, which turned out to be a very honest and stylized piece of music, which you can see has accompaniments for the violin and the pianoforte, many of which suggest that it was strikingly different from the rather simple and wild tune that Burns had imagined for the poem. The Red Red Rose was published again in the year 1797 in the fifth volume of Scott's Musical Museum by James Johnson. This time, however, the song was set to the music that Burns had originally suggested for the poem. The tune was called Major Graham's Strathspey and it was by a famous Scottish fiddler by the name of Miel Gow. Let's move on to the third section by first listening to the song in the tune Major Graham's Strathspey. Oh my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. 
Oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I. And I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gang dry. Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. Oh, I will love thee still, my dear, while the sun's o' oh, life shall run. Let's look at the first four lines of the song. Now, these four lines contain the most popular similes of all time and must be very, very, very familiar to you. But we'll just touch upon a few aspects of the poem. We can see that the speaker compares his love to a red rose that has just blossomed in June and later to a sweet melody. Now, a question that could naturally arise is whether the speaker is referring to the feeling of love or to his beloved in the use of the word love. Now, I believe that the answer uh, to this question is fairly simple and the speaker is indeed referring to his beloved. Uh, the clue to this answer can be found in the manuscript of Burns. You can see that in the first line, the speaker uses an uppercase L to refer to love. And in the last stanza of the poem, and fare thee weel, my only love, and fare thee weel a while, and I will come again, my love, though it were 10,000 mile. In these two lines, the speaker addresses his beloved directly and uses the uppercase L for love. On the other hand, when he refers to the feeling of love, as in this line, you know, as fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gung dry. Now, in these two lines, as you can see, the speaker uses the lowercase L. Now, that, I believe, gives us fair reason to assume that the uppercase L as with the uppercase D in these two stanzas, refer to the beloved herself. Coming back to the poem, scholars and critics of Burns' works have pointed out that the images in this poem that we often associate with Burns are found in broadsides and ballads of the period. Let's now compare these lyrics to four lines from The Wanton Wife of Castle Gate or The Boatman's Delight a song that existed nearly a century before Burns. Her cheeks are like the roses that blossom fresh in June. Oh, she's like a new strung instrument that's newly put in tune. We cannot but notice the coarse quality of these lines. It is highly likely that Burns refashioned these lyrics to suit the melody that he had in mind for the Red Red Rose. Um, in a work called uh, Desire, Drink and Death in English Folk and Vernacular Song, Vic Gammon notes that in many broadsides and ballads of the period, musical instruments are metaphors for female sexual organs. A newly strung instrument is one that is ready to be played on and often signifies a woman's sexual availability. Although burn seems to have replaced the word instrument with melody, we need to keep in mind that, considering that this work was part of a much broader ballad discourse, the words continue to have a sexual implication, although in a much subtler fashion. Coming to the second stanza of the poem, if the first stanza was an eloquent description of the beauty of the beloved, the second stanza compares her alluring beauty to the depth of the speaker's love. It then proceeds to a very hyperbolic expression of love when the speaker says that I love thee still my dear till all the seas gang dry. Do note the use of Scott's spelling as well as vocabulary in the poem. The word love is spelled L-U-B-E so is melody which is spelled M-E-L-O-D-I-E and notice the shortened form of the word all and the use of the word gang for go. Now compare these with the lines, as fair art thou, 
and I will love thee still. In an interesting reading of Burns' work, Graham Allen, in his work called Intertextuality, discusses that within this song, there is a clash between two distinct voices. On the one hand, Burns has used the official English language of uh, the Edinburgh society of the time, which is evident in these lines, As fair art thou, and I will love thee still. Whereas words such as Bonnie lass or the sea is gang dry are in the Scottish dialect. Now, these lines are reflective of two contradictory strengths in, in Scottish society at the time. One that attempted to move towards classifying a Scottish, the Scottish literary tradition and the other that showed an increasing interest in Scottish local dialects and popular culture. In fact, one could argue that it was the unique genius of Burns to create poetry that appealed to various classes of people and also interspersed elements of both a literary and an oral tradition with artful ease that elevates him to the status of Scotland's national bard. Let's now look at the third stanza of the poem. Till o'er the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. The last line of the previous stanza is repeated here, and the speaker continues his hyperbolic affirmations of love. And this stanza is replete with natural images that are evocative of the expanse of time. Seas drying up, rocks melting in the sun, and the speaker continues to say that she will be loved until the sands of life shall run. In the last stanza, the speaker bids farewell to his beloved in Scottish tongue and assures her of a return in yet another hyperbolic statement. And fare thee weal, my only love, and fare thee weal a while, and I'll come again, my love, though it were ten thousand mile. This extensive use of hyperbole in the last two stanzas gives way for an alternate reading of the poem. On the one hand, the hyperbole can be considered as reflective of the excitement of the speaker's new love. On the other hand, it can also be considered as indicative of the exaggerated promises of a lover who is playful and insincere and is in fact leaving the beloved despite all the promises he is making. In reading the last two stanzas, it is also important to keep in mind that most of the images that we find in this poem, such as the seas going dry and the rocks melting with the sun, and in fact even the lyrics, and fair thee wheel my only love, and fair thee wheel a while, are found in other poems of the time. But we'll not go into the details of those we have seen with the first stanza. Burns often refashions the lyrics to suit the tune that he has in mind for a song, and he's often uh, called a tone poet. In fact, Burns' success as a songwriter lies in his unique refashioning of pre-existing lyrics to suit a particular tone that he has in mind for the song. We've already discussed the use of short forms and Scottish words in the poem. Let's now look at the meter of the poem. You can see that the first and the third lines of every quatrain contain four iambic measures. So these, the first line and the third line are written in iambic tetrameter. On the other hand, the second and the fourth line contain three iambic measures. That's new, lee sprung, in June. That's sweet, lee played, in tune. So these two are in iambic trimeter. This pattern of alternating between iambic tetrameter and iambic trimeter continues throughout the poem. We'll also now take a look at the rhyme scheme of the first two stanzas. You can find that the first and the third line do not rhyme, and whereas the second and the fourth lines rhyme. June and tune, similarly, in the second quatrain, you have I and dry rhyming. Now, this pattern of rhyming in combination with the, the iambic tetrameter and trimeter is often called the ballad meter. So the first eight lines of this song are written in ballad meter. Let's now look at the last two stanzas. It's the use of the word dear in the third line of the second stanza that connects it to the third stanza as the word dear is repeated uh, in that one as well. 
here the poem continues to alternate between the iambic tetrameter and the iambic trimeter but the last two quatrains follow a different uh, rhyme scheme earlier uh, we saw that the first and the third lines didn't rhyme and that was called the ballad meter but this a pattern which is the ABAB pattern that you are familiar with in combination with the uh, alternating iambic tetrameter and trimeter is called the common meter. Now the words common meter and ballad meter are uh, used synonymously mainly because the common meter uh, is also used in ballads but es essentially the ballad meter and the common meter differ in the fact that the ballad meter is looser and more conversational in nature with only the second and the fourth lines of each quatrain rhyming with each other. That brings us to the end of the lesson. We'll never truly know the origins of the red red rose or the extent of Burns' contribution to the song. However, let's wind up with a letter that Burns wrote to Johnson in 1788. Burns wrote, Perhaps you may not find your account lucratively in this business, but you are a patriot for the music of your country, and I'm certain posterity would look on themselves as highly indebted to your public spirit. Burns seems to have hit the right note here. Neither he nor Johnson reaped monetary benefits from their songwriting, but the songs continue to live on and even learned in lessons such as these all over the world. Thank you for watching this video lesson. Please use the comment section for any questions that you may have and I'll be happy to answer those for you. Thank you.